Hi, and welcome to my video on basically the introduction to what is science and how do we begin to study science, uh, the nature of science, really. So before we can really talk about the nature of science, let's define what is science. So science is the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So here, the structure and the behavior, um, this encompasses so many different fields of science, like chemistry, physics, uh, biology, environmental science, geology, etc. Um, in the physical world, meaning like rocks and chemicals and forces, and the natural world, like biology, and how biology also interacts with chemistry as well as physics and geology. Um, and we study science or we study nature, the natural world, through both observation as well as experiment. So in an in a ideal like scientific classroom, uh, you would set up, or a research lab or something, you would set up what's called controlled experiments. But sometimes setting up a controlled experiment isn't the best way to understand the natural world. Uh, we rely on our observations. For example, if I was studying elephant behavior, it would be difficult to set up a controlled experiment with elephants in the wild. Instead, I would take lots of large-scale observational studies. Okay, so, uh, but what is an observation, right? So, scientists make observations using their five senses. So, touch, taste, smell, um, hearing, and... Oh, I'm missing one. Uh, touch? T oh, hearing. And so, with that, in science, we're not really going to taste things, but that is one of our five senses. So you can make observations that can be recorded, um, but you can also count observations as collecting data using scientific, scientific instruments. So if I was interested on how temperature affects the breathing rate of crickets, for example, it'd be hard to just sit and watch a cricket breathe. Instead, I might rely on some sensors or some probes into the container and um, set up crickets at different temperatures and then use the sensor to tell me um, how much like oxygen is being used or how much carbon dioxide is being produced. So sometimes we rely on scientific instruments for those observations. So here if I have um, a rose bush and I notice or I observe some aphids, which are little insects, on my rose bush. So throughout this video as well as the next video, I'll be using this rosebush and aphid example to kind of teach different ideas in science. So my observation is something I see. The aphids are on the green parts of the rosebush. Now, I don't uh, hear them. I don't taste them. I'm not um, touching the aphids, but I can see them, and that would be the five senses. And then I would collect data, and I could record. I could count. Like right here, I see six aphids on rosebush. Um, now, is this statement an observation? The aphids are only found on the green parts because that's their food source. So right here, um, this statement, this top part, uh, the first part actually, sorry, is an observation. The aphids are only found on the green parts. But now we've turned it by adding this part because that is their food source. Um, you're making kind of like an inference. Uh, an inference is when we draw conclusions based on our prior knowledge and our observations. So, for example, let's say that um, I'm teaching in my classroom and the principal walks in and says, uh, Mrs. Niemeyer, I need to speak to you for a moment. And, like, we step out into the hall and the rest of the students are like, ooh, uh-oh. Like, right away you're making inferences. You are using, like, past experience that like, ooh, when someone gets called out of the classroom, it is not good, right? That is your inference. You're putting your opinion into your observations. So the observation is Miss Niemeyer got called out of the classroom by the principal. Now, when you start to put guesses as to why, that is an inference. So let's go ahead and practice with this, an inference versus an observation. So I have eight statements, and I want you to think to yourself, um, is it an observation or is it an inference? So our first one, we're going to be using the picture here at the top left of the screen. So it says child A is holding a fishing pole. Yeah, that's something you can directly see. That is an observation. Child B is not interested in fishing. Well, that's going to be an inference because what you see is that child B is not even looking at the lake, doesn't seem interested, but that's kind of your opinion on what you're seeing 
Maybe she just got done fishing for a half hour and now it's child A's turn to learn, right? Um, the instructor is enjoying teaching. He may just be smiling. You don't know if he, maybe he's frustrated with little kids. You don't know. Uh, child C is taller than child B. Yeah, that's an observation. You can directly see that. The instructor is smiling. Also an observation. You can directly see that. Uh, they are at a high elevation. Now, this is where you might use your prior knowledge of like, hmm, when I've seen lakes before surrounded by trees, it's usually in a mountain setting, which would put it at a higher elevation. But we, unless we have the tools to measure the elevation in the picture, we don't know for certain. We would have to rely on some kind of measurement. So at this point, just looking at the picture, it'd be an inference. Um, but like I have my uh, Apple Watch actually has a, an option where I can measure my altitude. And so if I was actually there, then that would be an observation if I had the data that I collected. Uh, child A is the oldest of the kids. Uh, that's an inference based on height, but you don't really know. It could just maybe gone through a growth spurt. And then they are playing near a lake. True. We could see that. That is an observation. Okay. Good job. So let's go ahead then and uh, see well, what happens after a scientist makes observations, right? So let's say with those aphids, for example, they see the aphids and they're curious. Um, well, how do you get rid of aphids uh, in nature? Like if I have a garden and I have roses on one half and I have my vegetable garden in the other half of my plot in, of space, um, how can I like... Like, how can I get rid of aphids? Like, that would be my big question, right? So the next step, once you have a question that you're curious about, would be to um, do some research. Now, here I just did a quick Google search, but in reality, the type of research you do will be dependent on who you are as a scientist. Are you, like, me who's just at home curious how I can get rid of aphids? Or are you doing a science fair project where you need more research so that your question and your hypothesis can be more in-depth? and something new that you're testing? Or are you a professional, like your career is a research scientist, um, and therefore you would need to explore peer-reviewed uh, journals and see what science has already been done, what research already exists, how can you elaborate on it, how can you extend, how can you dig deeper, how can you confirm uh, science that has already been uh, happening? Right. So the level of research you do that you will then base your um, experimental design on is uh, dependent on the type of scientist that you are. Okay, so then uh, once we've done some research, our next step is to develop a scientific hypothesis. But really, what is a hypothesis? Now, this is one of my pet peeves in life, is the misuse of hypothesis in our society. Or I guess more realistically, we use the word hypothesis in our like TV or movies. Um, and the way we use it in everyday life is different than a scientific hypothesis. Uh, sometimes we'll say things like, oh, I have a hypothesis. But really, you're like, I have an idea. And if you grew up watching Dinosaur Train on PBS, they define hypothesis as um, an idea you can test, right? Which I love Dinosaur Train. Um, but anyway, a scientific hypothesis is an explanation that you can test. Now, you want to be careful here and not make a prediction. So um, we'll practice that here, but sometimes a prediction is just like a statement of what you think will happen. So a prediction does not include an explanation as to why it's happening. So that is a key uh, point to make. A prediction, you um, that's not a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is an explanation that you can test and it must meet two criteria. It needs to be testable uh, as well as falsifiable. Like you need to be able to test that hypothesis either through an experiment or lots of observations if it's a large scale thing uh, that you can't set up a controlled experiment for. Um, and it needs to be falsifiable. It's okay if your hypothesis is incorrect or it's disproven or it's rejected. That just means you get to do more science. You get to refine your hypothesis and try again. That's how we learn in science. If you can reject a hypothesis, that's still teaching us something. So just because your hypothesis wasn't correct, it's okay. It's still a beneficial experience. Okay. Uh, so uh, when we taught, like, why are we taught it's an educated guess? I think an educated guess is more of that 
uh, way we use the word hypothesis in everyday life. Like it's a guess. Uh, maybe kind of educated, like some prior knowledge is based on something you already know. Um, but anyway, we're going to practice with this vocabulary. We're going to practice with the words prediction, hypothesis, and observation. So I have these two bouncy balls that I actually bought. They're like a, from a magic kit. And I'm going to bounce them from the same height. And um, I'm going to drop them from the same height. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, make a prediction of what's going to happen. So what's going to happen if I drop them from the same height at the same time? This is where you'll use your like your life experiences, um, playing basketball or watching basketball or like um, handball or four square, dodgeball. Anytime you have a ball that bounces, right? So if you bounce a ball, is it going to go back to the same height that you started with? Is it going to, if you bounce a ball, if you just drop a ball, is it going to go in a different direction? If you drop two at the same time, will they go in the same direction? So predict, like what do you think is going to happen? Predictions are okay in science because then um, it helps kind of like set the tone for what you're going to experiment with and what you kind of think is going to happen. You can make predictions and then your predictions might not turn out or maybe they will. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to just hit pause and move my camera so you can make some observations. I want to use five senses and observe what's happening. Okay, so here I have the two bouncy balls, and I'm just going to make my screen this a uh, little bit bigger. So here, um, if I drop them from the same height at the same exact time, uh, let's go ahead, okay, so the same height, and make some observations. All right, so I'll go again. Now, this is more dramatic in my classroom when I can actually, like, throw them. Um, so here, watch, we'll drop one. Oops, I didn't even see that on camera. Ready? Here we go. We'll drop, bounce one. And then here's the other one. So if I do it with a little bit more force, you can see how one bounces and one does not. All right, so uh, let's go ahead. In your minds right now, I'm going to hit, hold on, let me switch my camera back. Okay, so in your minds right now, you just made some observations that one ball bounces and one ball doesn't. And so therefore, in your head, you're coming up with some explanations. You are thinking to yourself, wow, why didn't that one ball bounce? Right? So now you are proposing in your mind some kind of explanation, a reason why the one ball did not bounce. That is your hypothesis. It is an explanation that you can test. So you are developing a testable hypothesis to explain your observations. And so some uh, hypotheses or explanations that I have heard over the years in my classroom is that um, maybe they're made, one ball is more dense than the other one. Can you test that? Sure. Maybe you could put it in water, see if it floats or something. Uh, maybe one ball is solid and one is hollow. Well, you can test that. You can cut them open and look at the insides. Maybe, uh, maybe they're made of different types of rubber. Sure, you can test that. You can cut off a piece of rubber, send it to a lab, and analyze the material that it's made from, right? So here, whatever explanation of how you think that ball is not bouncing or why one bounces and one doesn't, because I will tell you, if we were in person and you held them in your hands um, and, like, you could not tell the difference uh, between them, except for one is more shiny than the other, but that's about the only difference. If your eyes were closed, you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, and so, therefore, that is your uh, hypothesis. So, let's go ahead and go back to that aphids example. So, with aphids, you um, do some research and you find out that they actually breathe through little holes in their bodies called spiracles. So, you're curious. You did research and found that when you spray, like a common way to treat them is to spray them with oil. Um, because the oil solution will block the holes that they breathe through in their bodies. Um, and so you decide to come up with an experiment using coconut oil. Because you know that when coconut oil is cool, it's a little thicker, it actually melts at 24 degrees Celsius. And when it's hotter, it's more liquid. And so you're curious, does the thickness of oil matter? Um, is it one more temperature more effective than another? So an appropriate hypothesis... Um, for this, I would like you, if you're one of my students watching this video, to pause the screen and think about uh, which is a good hypothesis here. All right, so the best one would be choice C. 
Okay, good.